Romans chapters 9. My kinsmen according to the flesh. Chapters 9 through 11 are a parenthetical portion about God's dealings with the nation of Israel in their past, present, and future. We are introduced to a new word in these three chapters. The word is election. It is used once in this ninth chapter and three times in chapter 11. It is used only two other times. Isaiah 45 verse 4 For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called. Thee by thy name, I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Its root is the word elect which is mentioned in chapter 8. Jacob is called God's servant, and Israel is called God's elect in Isaiah 45 verse 4. The Son of God is also called God's elect in Isaiah 42 verse 1. The doctrine of election as you will see by a simple study of the word in scripture is connected with the word service and not salvation. Election does not mean service, nor does elect mean servant. Christ is God's elect, and we as believers are called elect today because we are in Christ God's elect. Romans 9 verse 1 I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. This is evident in the book of Acts where we read about Paul wanting to go back to Jerusalem to reach his kinsmen there with the gospel regardless of the danger. The Holy Ghost agreed with Paul's witness concerning his countrymen. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5 For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Hebrews 9 verse 8 The Holy Ghost the signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Hebrews 10 verse 15 Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before. Romans 9 verses 2 to 3 That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. I could wish myself accursed from Christ. Paul knew better than any that there was no way he could take Israel's place of punishment by wishing himself accursed. To do so would make God unjust in allowing a sinner to die for other sinners. Christ is the only one that can die for another person and make the payment for their sins. Deuteronomy 21 verse 23 His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Joshua 6 verse 17 And the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein, to the Lord, only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. Joshua 7 verse 15 And it shall be, that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he, and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. This is similar to Moses wanting God to blot himself out of his book instead of the children of Israel for their sin against God. Exodus 32 verses 31 to 33 And Moses returned unto the Lord, and said, O, oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. My brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, fellow Israelites. Verse 4 below. Romans 9 verse 4 Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. The adoption, this is a reference to God's adopting Abraham's descendants for the specific task of being the nation that he would use to reclaim the earth with. The glory, this refers to the glory that God receives by the world when the few, believing Israel, manifests forth his glory by obedience to him. The covenants, these are the Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, and the new covenant that were all made with the nation of Israel. The giving of the law at Mount Sinai, Exodus 19 to 20. The service of God, this is a reference to the duty and calling to service that was given to Israel by God. 
It is what they as a nation were called and elected to do. The promises, promises made to the children of Israel, not the body of Christ. Romans 15 verse 8, Galatians 3 verses 16 to 21, Hebrews 6 12, 7 colon 6, 8 colon 6, 11 13, 17, 33 and 2 Peter 1 verse 4. Romans 9 verse 5 Whose are the fathers, and of whom is concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Romans 15 verse 8 Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Whose are the fathers, Israel belongs to God. Whom is concerning the flesh Christ came, concerning mankind, Christ came to his own, Israel, and his own received him not. John 14 verse 6. Who is over all? Jesus Christ is over Jew and Gentile alike. Romans 9 verses 6 to 7 Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, neither, because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children, but, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Genesis 21 verse 12 And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, and because of thy bondwoman, and all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Genesis 32 verse 28 His name meant supplanter. He was a deceiver. His new name Israel represents his new life after wrestling with God as he was returning back to the land of Israel. Not all of Jacob's descendants are Israel. Jacob had 12 sons, but God here is referring to the believing remnant of Israel as the true Israel in his eyes. The Israel of God. Galatians 6 verse 16. Just because someone was circumcised on the eighth day into a Jewish home does not make them an Israelite in God's eyes. Neither, because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children, since Abraham had Ishmael, and Isaac, Ishmael's lineage was not the promised seed. Not even all of Isaac's seed could be called Israel because Isaac had two sons as well, Esau and Jacob, Israel. Romans 9 verse 8 that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. The children of the flesh, Ishmael and his seed were children of the flesh because Abraham and Sarah didn't trust God to give them the seed, but thought he needed their help by giving Sarah's handmaid to Abraham to produce an heir. Esau was a child of the flesh only because he was not the one chosen to be the father of the nation of Israel. Only Jacob could be. The children of promise, Esau the elder would serve Jacob the younger because God had ordained that to happen. The promise had to go to Jacob even though he was a rascal because God elected it to be so. The word of promise, Genesis 18 verse 10, And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and, lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Romans 9 verses 10 to 12 And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. Genesis 25 verse 23 And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Malachi 1 verses 2 to 3 I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Saith the Lord, Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Three patriarchs are mentioned here in identifying the children of God, Israel, Isaac, and Abraham. Rebekah and Sarah are also mentioned to help further narrow down exactly who it is that God is referring to here. Circumcision is a matter of the heart. Trusting in the Messiah of Israel makes the Jew both physically and spiritually of Israel. Obviously, it was to Abraham and Sarah that the promise was given of a son. 
He is also the father of many others through the flesh or through his carnal relationship with Hagar, which bore Ishmael. Rebekah is mentioned because she bore two sons to Isaac, and God chose only one to be the one through whom the Messiah would come, and that was Jacob. The purpose of God according to election might stand Esau was elected to one day serve his younger brother, but nowhere in the story do we ever see Esau serving Jacob, they do however fight a lot. Esau will indeed serve Jacob when all nations serve the Messiah during the kingdom. Election has to do with what elect are called to do, not about being elected for salvation. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. The verse Paul is quoting is written well over a thousand years after Esau had already rejected God. Malachi 1 verses 2 to 3. Romans 9 verses 14 to 16. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So, then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Exodus 33 verse 19 And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will shew mercy on whom I will shew mercy. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, it is not of him that is born first that God has to choose, but God can choose to bless the younger instead on an occasion. No other elder sons were having this rule broken in their families. It was practiced by all the surrounding nations. A younger daughter was not supposed to be given in marriage before the elder. Jacob knew about this all too well. The exception proves the rule. God blessing Jacob instead of Esau proves the right of the firstborn. If it happened all the time, then it wouldn't be a rule. Mercy is a positive act of God and yet people blame God if he shows mercy to one, they think he should show mercy to all. Why? God can show mercy to whomever he pleases. Can you do whatever you will with what is yours? Does a stranger have the right to expect you to give to him the same gift that you gave to your child? No, of course not. God doesn't have to show mercy on sinners, but he does on those today who put their trust in his son for their salvation. That is the basis today for him showing mercy. We don't deserve it, just like those who don't accept his son, but he bestows mercy on us in spite of us on his son's behalf. God had a system of blessing the firstborn, and Esau sold his birthright for some pottage, and he later despised his birthright, but Jacob coveted it. God showed mercy to the one who wanted what God loved. Romans 9 verses 17 to 18 For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might shew my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Exodus 9 verse 16 and in very deed 4. This cause have I raised thee up, for to shew in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. It does not say here that God created Pharaoh to be damned, but that he raised him up so his power should be showed in him throughout all the earth. God used Pharaoh and his nation to bring glory unto himself and to have his name declared throughout all the earth. Romans 9 verses 19 to 21 Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay, of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, and another unto dishonor? Once again salvation is not the issue here, but service is. Some have erroneously devised a doctrine of irresistible grace out of this passage and a few others, but that is simply not the case. God knew that Pharaoh would resist him before he was ever born, and God still allowed him to be born. He could allow only people to be born that would eventually get saved, but he allows all the same opportunity to choose him or not. Paul introduces the picture of the potter, God, and the lump of clay. From the same lump of clay, dirt slash earth etc., God makes two vessels, one unto honor and another to dishonor. 
These vessels are mentioned in Jeremiah 18 verses 1 to 6. To make one vessel unto honor and another vessel unto dishonor, God can take a marred vessel of clay, the house of Israel in unbelief, and make a new vessel out of it unto his glory. Israel will be a vessel unto glory in the kingdom one day, but today for the most part, she is still a vessel unto dishonor. Romans 9 verses 22 to 23 What if God, willing to shew his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, to shew his wrath on the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, to make his power known, to make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. God wants the world to know him. The vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, the unbeliever who rejected God's witness to them. The vessels of mercy, the believers who accepted God's witness to them. God was long-suffering, and he used Paul first as a pattern of God's long-suffering to all who should believe on Jesus Christ after him, to life everlasting. Paul was a vessel of wrath, but God was long-suffering, not pouring out his wrath on him and his nation since then. Paul got saved and became the first vessel of mercy in this dispensation. We are also vessels of mercy. 1 Timothy 1 verses 15 to 16 This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might shew forth all longsuffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. A Jew can become a vessel of mercy today because of the cross. God is not pouring out his wrath today in the dispensation of grace, but once this dispensation is ended the wrath of God will be poured out on the vessels of wrath. That is why it is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Israel has not yet fulfilled all 70 weeks of punishment, wrath that God has promised that he would pour out. They have endured 69 weeks of it but not the last week, which will occur in the tribulation period. God in eternity past had a secret or mystery that he kept hidden from before the foundation of the world until after the cross, which he had afore prepared unto glory. He would bestow his mercy upon the Gentiles and make them vessels of glory in heavenly places. This gracious act shows the riches of his glory to all for all eternity. Romans 9 verses 24 to 25 Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles? As he saith also in Ozi, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. Hosea 2 verse 23 And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy, and I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Even us, in the previous 23 verses God talks about the vessels of mercy and of wrath from previous dispensations, and here he talks about us today in the dispensation of grace. Paul is the instrument today through which God showed the world his long-suffering in saving the chief of sinners and making him his apostle of the Gentiles. What grace! Romans 9 verse 26 And it shall come to pass, that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living, God. Hosea 1 verse 10 Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass, that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Ye are not my people, this is speaking of Israel, not the body of Christ. The house of Israel was called Lomi, not my people, in Ozi, Hosea, 1 colon 9 and 10, and the same nation will one day again be called the children of the living God. Romans 9 verse 27 Isaiah also creeth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Isaiah 10 verse 22 For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return, the consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. Romans 9 verse 28 For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the short work will the Lord make upon the earth. 
Isaiah 28 verse 21, For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim, he shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. A short work, what is the work that the Lord will make upon the earth that only a remnant of Israel will be saved out of? The 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble. What does Matthew 24 verse 22 and Mark 13 verse 20 teach us about the length of the days of Jacob's trouble? That God would shorten those days for the elects, Israel's sake, or they wouldn't survive those days and enter into their kingdom. The place where it was said, ye are not my people, is a reference to Israel in the Valley of Jezreel, also known as the Valley of Armageddon. The quote is from Hosea chapter 1 where God literally divorces Israel from himself because of their spiritual adultery. Paul alludes to the time of Jacob's trouble as only a remnant of Israel enduring unto its end. That time is shortened by God in righteousness so as to preserve the few remaining Jews left to enter into the kingdom along with the righteous Jews from the Old Testament days. Romans 9 verse 29, And as Isaiah said before, Except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodoma, and been made like unto Gomorrah. Isaiah 1 verse 9, Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. The Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 1 verse 9, As Sodoma, Sodom was utterly destroyed. Genesis 19 verse 24. Only God could have left Israel a seed, remnant, so they would not become destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah were. Romans 9 verses 30 to 33 What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in shown a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Isaiah 8 verses 14 to 15 And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble, and fall, and be broken, and be snared, and be taken. The righteousness which is of faith, Israel went about things all wrong, and many believers are following in their footsteps today by trying to be declared righteous by their works. The Law of Righteousness, the Law of Moses Israel as a nation has been temporarily set aside during this age and is a part of God's earthly plan to rule and reign on the earth during the kingdom. Chapter 10, Israel's Salvation. Romans 10 verses 1 to 2, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Acts 21 verse 20, And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou sayest, Brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Paul was referring to his own personal desire for reaching as many Jews of his day and time as he possibly could. Paul knew that Israel had been set aside, blinded, as a nation, and only a remnant would be saved. Romans 10 verse 3 For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Philippians 3 verse 9 And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. God's righteousness, Deuteronomy 9 verse 5, Psalm 24 colon 7, 51 colon 14, 71 colon 16, Isaiah 41 verse 10, Jesus Christ is the right hand of God's righteousness, Matthew 6 verse 33, Romans 3 colon 5, 21 to 22, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 and 2 Peter 1 verse 1. Their own righteousness, as protectors of the very oracles of God Israel was without excuse because they failed to see in them the absolute holiness of God and the utter sinfulness of mankind. 
It was given to them to show them their need for God to sanctify them, but they sought to sanctify themselves by their legalistic observance to man's interpretation of the law. The righteousness of God, Jesus is the righteousness of God spoken about that Israel would not submit to. Romans 10 verse 4 For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. Matthew 5 verse 17 Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. John 8 verse 24 I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Paul does not say that the law is the end for righteousness to everyone that obeys it. Belief in Christ is what makes one clean from their sins. The law was Israel's schoolmaster to point her to the Messiah, and once she had found her Messiah she no longer needed to be under her old schoolmaster. Galatians 3 verses 24 to 25 Romans 10 verse 5 For Moses describeth the righteousness, which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Leviticus 18 verse 5 Ye shall therefore keep my statutes, and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them, I am the Lord. The righteousness which is of the law, a man of faith who lived under the law prior to the cross, received the righteousness of the law by faith as he obeyed the commandments God had given to him. Prior to the law people received the righteousness of faith under the Abrahamic covenant apart from the works of the law. Romans 10 verses 6 to 7 But the righteousness, which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or, who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. Deuteronomy 30 verses 11 to 13 For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven, that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven, and bring it unto us, that we may hear it, and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea, that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us, and bring it unto us, that we may hear it, and do it? The righteousness which is of faith, Israel sought God's righteousness by the keeping of the law, but they rejected the Christ whom the law spoke of. Israel needed to recognize the works that Jesus did as a fulfillment of the law, but they did not. Romans 10 verse 8 But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith, which we preach, Deuteronomy 30 verse 14 But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth, and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. The word of faith, which we preach, Israel had heard the truth from Moses in the past, but they also needed to hear Christ when he came to them, and when the apostles preached to them. Verse 9 When Paul says the word of faith, which we preach, he is not saying he preached the law of Moses. Deuteronomy 30 He is also not saying that he preached the gospel of the kingdom that the twelve apostles all preached to Israel. He is saying that just as both of those two preceding messages were supposed to be accompanied by faith, so was Paul's message to be believed by faith alone. Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9 For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There was not a list of works that would accompany their belief as in the past. Romans 10 verse 9 That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Notice the two words mouth and heart that are used here. They are coming from the previous verse in Deuteronomy 30 verse 14 that was spoken to Israel. The word of faith is confession of Jesus as Israel's Lord, coupled with a belief in their heart that God has raised him from the dead. Notice the word Paul uses here is confess, and not profess. Israel had to confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that God had raised Christ from the dead to be saved. Some make salvation dependent upon one's public profession of faith, which is a work that can never save anyone today. A lot of confusion surrounds one's making a public profession of one's faith with their mouth, because in the same portion of scripture it also says that they must believe with their heart. Is the heart that pumps blood capable of believing anything, 
or is that simply symbolic of the mind believing? The truth is that a person is saved today by faith alone, without the works of the law, simply by believing in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Romans 10 verse 10 For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, Genesis 15 verse 6 And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Deuteronomy 30 verse 14 But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth, and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. Proverbs 23 verse 7 For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he, eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. Mark 11 verse 23 For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Luke 24 verse 25 Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. John 14 verse 1 Let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God, believe also in me. Acts 8 verse 7 For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The word salvation has two meanings. It can mean a physical deliverance from someone or something that is temporal in nature, like being saved from getting hurt, or it can mean a spiritual deliverance from the wages of sin for all eternity. Romans 10 verse 11 for the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Isaiah 28 verse 16 Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, he that believeth shall not make haste. Isaiah 49 verse 23 And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers, they shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Paul mentions two things, believing with the heart unto righteousness, and confession with the mouth unto salvation, and he uses an Old Testament verse here in verse 11 to prove what he said in verse 10. The he that believeth from Isaiah 28 verse 16 was understood by Israel to be other Jews who would one day believe in their Messiah in Christ's day and those in the tribulation period while his kingdom was being preached as at hand. Romans 10 verses 12 to 13 For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here Paul says that there is, present tense, at the time Paul was writing, no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. The words call upon the Lord in verse 13 go hand in hand with the second part of verse 10, which says that with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There is a lot of disagreement as to the parenthetical chapters of Romans 9-11 to as to what in these three chapters can be applied to the body of Christ, because the subject of these three chapters are clearly Israel. Romans 14 verse 5 Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. See 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4 for the easiest description of what a person needs to believe today in order to be saved. Romans 10 verses 14 to 15 How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach, except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Isaiah 52 verse 7 How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God read Nath. It is important to keep the context of these three parenthetical chapters to get the whole meaning of what Paul is trying to teach us here. Remember that chapters 9 through 11 are dealing with the nation of Israel and what God is doing with them in Paul's day as compared to how he has dealt with them in the past. Some things have remained the same while others have changed dramatically. For instance, today there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, but that was not always the case. 
God had given the Jew many advantages, but with their rejection of Christ, those advantages have now turned into disadvantages because they will be used as a witness against them for rejecting God's Son. Notice what Isaiah says. Romans 10 verse 16, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Isaiah 53 verse 1, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? They have not all obeyed the gospel, that they is Israel that Isaiah was speaking about. Lord, who hath believed our report, Isaiah is asking the Lord, who in Israel believe God's word through the prophets and apostles' mouths. Romans 10 verses 17 to 18, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Faith cometh by hearing, faith does not come by confessing with your mouth. Paul quotes Isaiah 53 and begins by saying that Israel would not believe her prophet's words, which is evidenced by their crucifying the Messiah. Israel was without excuse because they had every advantage. They had the word of God, and it was with them wherever they went, but they could not recognize their own Messiah because of the sin of pride. Verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Christ originally commanded his twelve apostles not to go the Gentiles, nor into any city of the Samaritan before his resurrection. After his resurrection, however, and after Pentecost, those Jews who came to the feast from all over, Act 2 colon 1 11, and heard the gospel of the kingdom took it back to their Jewish communities scattered amongst the Gentiles throughout the world. Romans 10 verse 19, But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Deuteronomy 32 verse 21 They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God, they have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people, I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. The word provoke is used 42 times and most of those times it is speaking of Israel provoking God to anger. Here God says he is going to provoke Israel to jealousy. Who is the foolish nation that Paul reminds Israel about from the writing of Moses? Many have guessed that it is the church, but the church is not a nation. Israel is the nation, but which Israel? A foolish nation, the foolish nation is the little flock of believers in the Jesus, including the twelve apostles. The believing remnant in Israel were the Israel of God, not the unbelieving Jewish majority, God often called his sheep. The word remnant is used 70 times in relationship to Israel in the Bible. Galatians 6 verse 16, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. Luke 12 verse 32 Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The apostles shall sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel as a nation within a nation. Matthew 19 verse 28 Romans 10 verse 20 But Isaiah is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not, I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Isaiah 65 verse 1 I am sought of them that asked not for me, I am found of them. That sought me not, I said, behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not. Called by my name. The Messiah was literally saying to Israel, behold me, behold me while he ministered to Israel for three years and they would not behold him. Isaiah is very bold, he was bold in saying that the nation of Israel was not really seeking after God, a remnant however was. I was found of them that sought me not. This is speaking of the little flock of Israel beginning with the twelve apostles and all of the other Jewish people that believed on Jesus when he came unto his own. They were not looking for him, but he found them not in the rabbinical schools of Jerusalem that were elevating man's traditions above the word of God, but these were found while fishing or sitting at the receipt of customs. Whenever you deviate from the word as Israel's religious leaders did you can search all you want for the Messiah, but you will not be able to find him because your tradition will block your view. In the four gospels Jesus speaks of the little flock as being a foolish nation that was no nation. 
God takes a remnant out of Israel that is the believing remnant and makes a new nation out of a nation. Luke 12 verse 32 Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Romans 10 verse 21 But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. All day long I have stretched forth my hands, to oppose with your hands in battle, to pray or plead with your hands. God was doing the later. Chapter 11 Hath God cast away his people? The preceding two chapters explain why God gave up Israel temporarily, while this chapter explains the election of a remnant of Israel that God was still saving during Paul's early ministry. It is important to remember that although God was giving up Israel as he had already done to the Gentiles, Romans 1, he was not replacing Israel with the church. That is called replacement theology, and that is a doctrine of devil straight from Satan himself. Romans 11 verse 1 I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Hath God cast away his people, to thrust forth, to thrust away, to put it from you, to put away? Acts 7 verses 27 and 39, 13, 46 and 1 Timothy 1 verse 19. God did not cast away all of Israel, only those who didn't believe. A remnant believed. Remember only a remnant of two people entered into the promised land, Caleb and Joshua, and the rest never did because of unbelief. This chapter was written in the Acts 20 time period which proves that Israel fell many years before Acts 28 and were then cast away. Israel fell in Acts 7 with the stoning of Stephen, which means the body of Christ had to have started before Acts 20. The body of Christ started with the salvation of Saul of Tarsus in Acts 9, and then the first Gentile was saved in Acts 13. The body of Christ is Jews and Gentiles in one body. I also am an Israelite, a descendant of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Israel slash Jacob was the father of twelve sons who became known as the twelve tribes of Israel. Genesis 32 verse 28 And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince hast, thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Paul says here that he was not cast away, so remember that when determining who the remnant according to the election of grace is. The tribe of Benjamin, the youngest son of Jacob, and the smallest tribe. The tribe that King Saul came from. Genesis 35 verse 18 And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Romans 11 verses 2 to 4 God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? How he mocketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and digged down thy altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men, who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. 1 Kings 19 verses 10 to 18 Israel as a whole was not cast away after the crucifixion, for Paul himself was an Israelite. Even in Elijah's day there was a remnant who believed. Paul ministered at a very unique time in history when God was moving from Israel's prophecy program to the church, which is Christ's body, and its mystery program. His people which he foreknew, his people is speaking about the children of Israel. The he here is God. The word foreknew means to know beforehand. Acts 26 verse 5 which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most straightest sect of our religion I lived a Pharisee. Romans 8 verse 29 For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. 2 Peter 3 verse 17 Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Romans 11 verse 5 Even so then, at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. At this present time, when Paul was writing this epistle, 
a remnant according to the election of grace. There was during Paul's day, a remnant of Jews saved according to the election of grace. They were those that Paul always went after first whenever he went somewhere preaching the gospel, to the Jew first, and then to the Gentiles. Paul is not saying that there is a remnant of 7,000 Jews saved in every generation. Paul is our pattern today for believing by faith and receiving salvation by God's grace. Paul was the least deserving man on the planet to be saved, and yet God saved the chief of sinners, who was God's number one enemy on the earth at that time. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15 and 16 By the end of the Acts period Paul no longer went to the Jew first, instead he received new revelations from God which are found in his prison epistles. Today we are to consider the Jews just like we consider Gentiles, as our equals, with no preferential treatment for either of us. Romans 9 11, 11 7, 28, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 14 and 1 Peter 1 verse 10. The word remnant means that which remains. Isaiah 11 verse 11, Romans 11 verse 6 and if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise, work is no more work. Then is it no more of works, this is not a question that Paul is asking, but rather a statement is being made about salvation in times past as compared to now. That it's spoken about is salvation, and Paul says it is no more of works. If salvation today is no more of works, what does that imply in times past, prior to the dispensation of grace? Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9 For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 11 verses 7 to 8 What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear winky face unto this day. Isaiah 29 verse 10 For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. That which he seeketh for, Israel was seeking for righteousness. The election, this is the remnant according to the election of grace mentioned in the preceding verses. It, the it that Paul refers to, is the righteousness of faith mentioned above. The remnant of believing Israel received it, the righteousness of faith, because they were not trusting in their own works, but in the work of Jesus dying for their sins. The rest were blinded, the rest of Israel were blinded spiritually. It did not say they were blind. If Israel were blind, they would have an excuse, but because they were able to see, and they refused to see what was right in front of them, God blinded them, because they heard the words of their prophets and rejected them, he caused them not to be able to hear, to understand. Psalm 69 verses 22 to 23, Romans 11 verses 9 to 10, and David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back alway. Psalm 69 verses 22 to 23 Let their table become a snare before them, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened, that they see not, and make their loins continually to shake. Their table, this is a similitude for the place Israel was to go for spiritual refreshment. Unfortunately, they went to tradition, instead of to the word of God, and it cost them greatly. That burden was too heavy for Israel to carry back then, but she continues to bow down her back under the impossible load of the law even today. Romans 11 verse 11 I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their false salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Have they stumbled, Israel stumbled and fell as the nation of favor, and their kingdom was postponed. Psalm 27 verse 2 When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Romans 9 verse 32 Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. 
Their fall, Israel's fall as the channel of blessing to the Gentile nations. Isaiah 60 verse 3, And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. They have not fallen forever. They will get back up as a nation one day. For the time being, however, they are placed on a shelf until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. To provoke them to jealousy, Gentiles being saved would provoke Jews to be jealous for the salvation that God was sending to the Gentiles. Romans 11 verse 12 Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? The fall of them, Israel. The riches of the world, the Gentile nations receiving salvation. The diminishing of them, Israel's decline from their status as the channel of salvation to the Gentile nations. John 4 verse 22 Ye worship ye know not what, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Their fullness, Israel will reach their full potential as a nation in the future millennial kingdom when Christ sits on his throne, and they rule and reign with him. Romans 11 verse 13 For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. I speak to you Gentiles, Paul is speaking to Gentiles. Gentiles are non-Jews. Keep that in mind as you study the rest of this chapter. Some have failed to do so, and they have divided the body of Christ unnecessarily. The apostle of the Gentiles, there were 12 apostles to the nation of Israel, but God has only one apostle that is distinguished as the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office, God gave Paul the office, and he was to magnify it to the world for them to follow. 1 Timothy 1 verses 15 to 16 This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might shew forth all longsuffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul was not one of the twelve, nor the thirteenth apostle, their ministry was to the nation of Israel, also known as the circumcision. Romans 11 verses 14 to 15 If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be, but life from the dead? Provoke to emulation, Paul wanted to provoke his fellow Jews to receive Christ as their Savior. The casting away of them, the them is Israel who were cast away by God for their unbelief. Again, this proves the body of Christ began sometime prior to this time, Acts 20, when Romans was written. It was immediately after the casting away of Israel, Acts 9. The reconciling of the world, the bringing of salvation straight to the Gentiles apart from the law given to Israel. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 19 to 20 to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. What shall the receiving of them be, the nation, apart from the remnant were cast away, so the whole world could be reconciled to God, and since that is the case now, what will it be like when they are received back by God at the onset of the kingdom? Glorious! Life from the dead, this is what Paul says will happen for believing Israel from all generations. Israel will be born again when they are resurrected and enter into their kingdom. First fruit, lump, root, and branches. Romans 11 verse 16 For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. For if the first fruit be holy, the word for at the beginning of this verse connects the section to the previous. This is a reference to a group of believers that precedes an even bigger group of believers. The first fruit was not the whole harvest, but a first sampling of the whole crop. The lump is also holy. The lump in scripture is a reference to the whole bunch. For example, Isaiah says, take a lump of figs. Isaiah 38 verse 21. It is similar to a cluster of grapes. Not all of Israel are saved or will be saved, but all believing Jews make up a lump or a cluster.
If the root be holy, so are the branches. This is either Paul re-emphasizing his previous point with another similitude, or he is going all the way back to Abraham as the initial root, and his believing offspring as the natural branches. The branches represent Jews in a tree that are meant to produce good fruit. If Israel did not produce fruit, the branches would be broken off for a time for new branches to be grafted in. A wild olive tree. Romans 11 verses 17 to 18 And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. If some of the branches be broken off, the olive tree represents Israel, and the branches that have been broken off are unbelieving Israel. The wild olive tree represents the body of Christ made up of Jews and Gentiles in one body where there is no difference. And thou, being a wild olive tree, notice that God is speaking directly to the wild olive tree, which tells us that they coexisted at the same time. Notice that both trees are olive trees, one identified so far just as an olive tree, Israel, and one as a wild olive tree. Israel is depicted as four different types of trees beginning in Judges 9 verse 8 with the olive tree, fig, vine, and bramble. What is the difference? Didn't the Jewish nation once all come from a Gentile by the name of Abram? What happened to that wild olive tree named Abram? He became something he wasn't. A good olive tree by his faith. He received circumcision and became the father of the no longer wild olive tree, but a tree in a covenant relationship with its creator. That tree would later get the law given to them and it would help prune that tree into a good tree. Grafton, the words are used together only four times and all are found in this chapter. Romans 11 verses 19 and 23 and 24. Romans 11 verses 19 to 20 Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in, that thou here is the body of Christ, made up of Jews and Gentiles in one body. Well, God agrees that the natural branches were broken off so that the wild branches could be grafted in. Because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, while thou is singular, it can represent a single group, like the body of Christ. Then God's word tells us why the natural branches of the olive tree, Israel, were broken off. Unbelief, which is the opposite of faith. They did not believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, so they were broken off after they were given. Ample opportunities to hear the truth and see the signs that accompanied the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. Romans 11 verse 21 For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. The natural branches, unbelieving Israel. Be not high-minded, but fear, we in the body of Christ have no reason to fear that God will also not spare us because we are eternally secure under grace. These believers were told to take heed of what happened to Israel unless they make the same mistake and suffer the same consequence. Take heed lest he also spare not thee. This is speaking of the Gentiles as a whole as he did when he previously gave them up and saved Abram. Romans 1 verses 24 and 26 and 28. The time for Gentiles to be saved apart from Israel is today before the rapture occurs. God will start dealing with the world through Israel again once we are taken out of here. Many individuals have feared these verses and have used them and taught that one might lose their salvation if God so chose not to spare them. These verses are not speaking about individuals, but the Gentiles as a whole being compared to the Jewish nation as a whole. Israel was cast away in Acts 7, and the dispensation of grace will end at the rapture, and we should take heed of that and get busy for the Lord building up the body of Christ. Romans 11 verses 22 to 23 Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God, on them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, 
if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted, for God is able to graft them in again. Them which fell, the unbelieving Jews as a nation have received the severity of God, but the Gentiles have received the goodness of God in this dispensation because of their faith in Jesus. The, the Gentiles who believe in Christ today, receive the goodness that comes from God alone. An individual Gentile who believes the gospel and is saved and receives the goodness of God is eternally saved, secured, and can never lose their salvation. If thou continue in his goodness, if the Gentiles as a whole make the same mistake that the nation of Israel did as a whole, then the Gentiles like Israel was, will be cut off. This passage is not talking about a saved individual losing their salvation, but about the Gentiles as a whole, just like it is talking about Israel as a whole. It would be very fair to say that only a remnant of Gentiles believe the gospel today. We are quickly becoming just like Israel was when they were cut off. It was not a hard thing for God to graft wild olive branches in by faith to the natural olive tree, and it will be even easier to graft back in the natural branches, Israel, when they return by faith. This will happen on a large scale when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and the rapture occurs. Israel's prophecy program will kick back in and the Jews will begin to believe the preaching of the 144,000 and the two witnesses and those that do believe in their Jewish Messiah will be grafted back in again. A good olive tree. Romans 11 verse 24 For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be graft into their own olive tree? The olive tree which is wild by nature, this statement helps us understand this whole chapter, but it is almost always overlooked or ignored because it doesn't say what some want it to say. The olive tree is wild by nature, like Gentiles. A good olive tree, a tree, Israel, that has been pruned by its owner, God, by his word. Read all of Psalm 52 verses 1 to 9. Psalm 52 verses 1 to 9 to the chief musician, Maskil, a psalm of David, when Dob the Edomite came and told Saul, and said unto him, David is come to the house of Ahimelech. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, almighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. Thy tongue deviseth mischiefs, like a sharp razor, working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Selah. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy thee forever, he shall take thee away, and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place, and root thee out of the land of the living. Selah. The righteous also shall see, and fear, and shall laugh at him, Lo, this is the man. That made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches, and strengthened himself in his wickedness. But I am like a green olive tree. In the house of God, I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise thee forever, because thou hast done it, and I will wait on thy name, for it is good before thy saints. David bare good fruit for God because of his faith, while Dog and Saul bared corrupt fruit because of their lack thereof. Romans 11 verses 25 to 26 For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so, all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Shaun the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Psalm 14 verse 7 O oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. When the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. Isaiah 59 verse 20 And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Ye should not be ignorant of this mystery, one of the mysteries revealed to Paul that we in the body of Christ, brethren, are to be stewards of. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1 Let a man so account of us, as of the ministers of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Paul warns his readers that they shouldn't be ignorant of God's dealings with Israel because they will become wise in their own conceits and will stumble doctrinally as a result of it. 
Every major difference in most denominations is because they begin to spiritualize verses that belong to Israel. Israel's blindness is only temporary until the rapture occurs when the fullness of the Gentiles is come in. Israel's blindness is not the mystery that is found in the Old Testament. The mystery revealed through Paul is that we Gentiles are blessed with salvation today apart from Israel. Salvation today is not of the Jews as it was in time past. All Israel shall be saved, Psalm 14 verse 7 and Isaiah 59 verse 20. Romans 11 verse 27 For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Isaiah 27 verse 9 By this therefore shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged, and this is all the fruit to take away his sin, when he mocketh all the stones of the altar as chalk stones that are beaten in sunder, the groves and images shall not stand up. Isaiah 30 verse 15 For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength, and ye would not. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34 Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. At the end of the tribulation period all of Israel that remains will be both saved physically and spiritually and go into her kingdom. The believing dead of Israel are then resurrected to eternal life, and the nation as a whole is born again in a day. That is when the New Testament is written on the hearts of the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The two houses shall also become one nation. Romans 11 verses 28 to 29 as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The gospel, faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4. They are enemies, as in Paul's day the blinded nation of Israel is an enemy of the gospel and of those that preach it. While they may not be taking up arms against Christianity, they are in total opposition to its teachings because of their traditions. As touching the election, Paul says that they are beloved for the Father's sake, because of the election, believing Israel. They were not beloved for the Father's sake because of the unbelieving majority of the nation. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. This is a fact stated concerning Israel and God's final purpose for them as a nation in Christ's future kingdom. Verse 29 will help you understand the transitional situation that occurred during the Acts period, which is dealt with in our Acts study at the beginning of this volume which you are reading. This verse is almost always used totally out of its context to get people not to quit something. It is talking about Israel and her future role in the kingdom. God will not change his mind concerning them today, nor in the future. Romans 11 verses 30 to 32 For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Ye Gentiles, in times past, before the dispensation of grace. Ephesians 2 verse 3 Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. The Gentiles were all concluded in unbelief at the Tower of Babel, then God called out Abraham and saved him and made him the father of the Jewish nation. Obtained mercy, obtained salvation. Now, in the dispensation of grace. Ephesians 2 verse 13 But now in Christ Jesus ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. 
Their unbelief, the unbelieving in the nation. After Christ's rejection by Israel, God then concluded both Jew and Gentile in unbelief so that he now by grace could have mercy on all of us that would believe. Your mercy, we today need to be merciful unto the natural olive tree, Israel, so that we might bring some of them to faith. God has concluded both Jew and Gentile in unbelief so that he may have mercy on us all if we will believe by faith. Romans 1-3 There is no difference today between Jew and Gentile today, for all must come to him by faith alone, apart from any works of the law. Romans 11 verse 33 owed the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. 1 Kings 10 verse 23 So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. 2 Chronicles 1 verses 11 to 12 And God said to Solomon, Because this was in thine heart, and thou hast not asked riches, wealth, or honor, nor the life of thine enemies, neither yet hast asked long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself, that thou mayest judge my people, over whom I have made thee king, wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee, and I will give thee riches, and wealth, and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee, neither shall there any after, thee have the like. 2 Chronicles 9 verse 22 And King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. Psalm 36 verse 6 Thy righteousness is like the great mountains, thy judgments are a great deep, O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. Psalm 104 verse 24 O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all, the earth is full of thy riches. Job 11 verse 7 Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? Romans 11 verse 34 For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Isaiah 40 verse 13 Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or being his counselor hath taught him? Jeremiah 23 verse 18 For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord? And hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word, and heard it? Romans 11 verse 35 Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? Job 35 verse 7 If thou be righteous, what givest thou him? Or what receiveth he of thine hand? Romans 11 verse 36 For of him, and through him, and to him, are all things, to whom be glory for ever. Amen. Colossians 1 verse 16 For by him were all things created, that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, or dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him, and for him. God in his infinite wisdom devised a program for the redemption of the earth with the nation of Israel, and the heavens with the body of Christ, the church, and both of these programs are centered in Jesus Christ. Chapter 12 The Practical Part We now come to the practical part of the book of Romans which fits perfectly with chapters 1 through 8 where the Apostle Paul so beautifully delineated many of the doctrinal truths regarding salvation. God saw fit to place the practical part of this book after the parenthetical section regarding God's dealings with the nation of Israel during this age of grace. Here believers learn what we are to do now that we have this understanding of the change taking place with God, the nation of Israel, and the body of Christ. Romans 12 verse 1 I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I beseech you, Paul is begging his readers to follow his instructions. By the mercies of God, Romans 11 verses 30 to 32. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. God doesn't need dead sacrifices that can't be used to reach others. Give him your best. Holy, this speaks about the condition of our sacrifices, they ought to be holy. Your reasonable service, that which is expected of every believer. Romans 12 verse 2 And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, and acceptable, and perfect, will of God. This world, the world system, of which Satan is the ruler, 
Ephesians 2 verse 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. This verse means that you shouldn't allow the trends of the world to dictate what you do, where you go, how you speak, and what you wear. The renewing of your mind, our minds are of this world because we are sinners, but we renew our minds daily with prayer, scripture study, and fellowship with other believers. That ye may prove what is that good, and acceptable, and perfect, will of God, God has a perfect plan for the body of Christ today to fulfill his will. We are to renew our minds concerning that plan that had been kept secret from before the world began, but now it has been made manifest. Romans 16 verse 25 Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Romans 12 verse 3 For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. The grace given unto me, Paul was first given grace in order to be saved, and then to be the apostle unto us, to educate us in the body of Christ concerning his plan for his body. Paul here warns believers of the snare of pride concerning their walk. We are not to think our gift or office is more important than someone else in the body of Christ. The measure of faith. You don't need the amount of faith Paul needed to be our apostle, but he gave you the exact amount of faith you will need to do his will for you in the body of Christ. Romans 12 verses 4 to 5 For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Many members in one body. Paul refers to the church as the body of Christ. The doctrines of concerning the body of Christ were given by revelation to us today through the Apostle Paul. Ephesians 5 verses 21 to 33 and Colossians 1 verse 18. This occurred after the Jews as a nation had rejected the kingdom offered to them in the Gospels and in the early part of the book of Acts. Office, a position of responsibility in the body, church. Romans 12 verses 6 to 8 Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth, on teaching, or he that exhorteth, on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that rolleth, with diligence, he that showeth mercy, with cheerfulness. The grace given unto us, this speaks of the gifts given unto each member of the body of Christ, the church. It also speaks about how each should minister in the areas they have been gifted in. Prophecy, they were to prophesy according to the proportion of faith given to them, and they were not to say God spoke when he did not. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2 And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3 But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, and exhortation, and comfort. Ministry, let all things be done decently and in order. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 1 to 8 Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass, or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, whether there be tongues, they shall cease, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. He that teacheth, teaching doctrine. He that exhorteth, instruction in God's word.
Luke 3 verse 18 and many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. Acts 13 verse 15 and after the reading of the law and the prophets the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Acts 20 verse 2 and when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece. He that giveth to share. He that ruleth, a elder slash leader in the church. 1 Timothy 5 verse 17 Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. He that showeth mercy, forgiving others, telling others the gospel so they may be saved. Romans 12 verse 9 Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Let love be without dissimulation, deceit, or hypocrisy. Do you love what God loves, or what your flesh loves? Abhor, hate that which is evil to the point of distancing yourself from it. In these next 11 verses, Paul describes specific virtues that should be in every member of the body of Christ. Romans 12 verses 10 to 13 Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality, in honor preferring one another, putting others first, fervent in spirit, a zealous desire to do things for God in a way pleasing to Him, rejoicing in hope, having a positive outlook because we know God works all things together for good, patient in tribulation, someone who trusts God to see them through things, continuing instant in prayer, a person of prayer who prays when they learn of a need, distributing to the necessity of saints. If a believer your assembly didn't have one of the necessities of life, like food, then the church should help that person out. A temporary helping hand. This differs from the requirement Jesus told believers of the kingdom message while it was at hand. They had to sell all that they had and to come and follow him. Matthew 19 verse 21, Luke 12 33, 14 26, 27 and 33. Romans 12 verse 14, Bless them which persecute you, bless, and curse not. Matthew 5 verse 44. Romans 12 verse 15 Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 26 And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Romans 12 verse 16 Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Be not wise in your own conceits. Be of the same mind, like-minded. Mind not high things, exalted things like power and prestige. Men of low estate, common people. Romans 12 verses 17 to 19 Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as leith in you, live peaceably with all. Men, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Deuteronomy 32 verse 35 To me belongeth vengeance, and recompense, their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 21 Providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. Avenge not yourselves. Don't get revenge. Give place unto wrath. Love them by showing them mercy like God showed you. Romans 12 verse 20 Therefore if thine enemy hunger, feed him, if he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Matthew 5 verse 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you. Proverbs 25 verse 22, For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head, 
Paul was the chief leader of sinners, and yet God reached down on the Damascus road and saved his worst enemy. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15 This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Saul of Tarsus was kicking against the pricks of conviction when he saw believers responding to him in Christ like love instead of hatred while he was persecuting them. Acts 9 verse 5 And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Romans 12 verse 21 Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome of evil to let evil enrage you to the point you are of no good to anyone.